Good evening, everybody. It's uh, great to be here again, to see you all. And, uh, it's been a sunny day, isn't it? I was just looking out for the deck this afternoon across the farm and just uh, looking at all the work that I don't have to do until tomorrow. <laughs> awesome. Come in, up there. Come and have a seat. Nice to have you here. This evening we're looking at Luke chapter 19, so if you'd like to turn with me to Luke chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 11. It's a familiar passage. It's 10 healed of leprosy. Before we read, let's, uh, let's ask God for his help. Almighty God, we thank you again that you've given us your word. And we do pray this evening that as we read it, that you'll really speak to each one of us. We have so many needs to be addressed, so many ways in which we need to be encouraged. And Father, we know that you deal with each of us individually. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here in this room tonight and minister to us, speak to our hearts, so that uh, each life, each soul here, would be able to grow and to benefit and to be of use to your service and to be able to glorify you in the way that we should. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Jesus in the Gospels is recorded as having healed many people from many illnesses, ailments and diseases. I believe one of the most tragic ones to contract is leprosy. And now you might immediately be to differ about that. You might say, well, what about a deaf mute? That must be pretty miserable. Not being able to uh, hear, not being able to speak, maybe being blind as well. Uh, you might say, what about a paralysed man? And that's true enough, isn't it? Both nasty and debilitating uh, conditions, uh, physically and psychologically. <laughs> Leprosy, though, is physically and socially a particularly nasty one to get. And I've talked on this a few years ago and um, done a little bit more research since, but it's tormented humans throughout recorded history. And the earliest account, from what I can find, is... Um, it appears on an Egyptian papyrus sheet uh, around about 1550 BC. Throughout its history, it has been feared and misunderstood. It's been misunderstood in that people sometimes have thought it to be hereditary, passed on from one generation to another. Some have thought it to be a curse from God or a punishment from God for sins. It's fear because it can appear any time. It has an incubation period, I understand, of anywhere up to 20 years. And so it's particularly <coughs> hard to track as to where you contract it from. It's fear because of the physical aspects of it. And if you are familiar with it, and you may be a lot more familiar, some of you, than, than, than what I am, I can only go by what I've read. And I haven't noticed anybody with leprosy here tonight um, coming in the door. We don't have it in New Zealand. But it has symptoms such as swelling to the face, blindness, glaucoma, damage to the lining of the nose, so you have uh, incessant bleeding. Uh, it can cause infertility in men. It can cause kidney failure, muscle weakness, nerve damage and so loss of feeling, 
which causes further damage as well because once you have loss of feeling, then you tend to damage yourself by, by means of burns, cuts, and then infections, etc. And you can have loss of movement. You, your hands can end up in a, end up in a claw like position, and your feet can become quite unusable as well. Fear also, because once you've got it, you are no longer allowed in society. So physically, it was feared. Socially, a terrible thing to have. You were driven out of your home, out of your street, and out of your town to the outskirts, away from the general population. Now, if that was Wyndham today, then I guess they would be lepers. If you had a leprosy, you'd be driven over the flood bank and behind the, the Wyndham race course there into a um, a place where only other people with leprosy would be there gathering. For all intents and purposes, you no longer existed. Your status had shifted from being a human to a leper. Now that's a bit like being shifted from a, a human to a shearer, perhaps, or a, um, or a contractor, or a teacher, where we become defined by our occupation. So you're no longer a person who shears, or a person who does contracting, or a person who teaches. You're defined by your occupation. And so there were leper colonies that were formed when you ended up separated from the ones you loved, and you were forced into this unnatural sort of coexistence with others with whom you had nothing in common except a terrible disease. It was feared because at the time there was no known cure. Now we have um, multi-drug therapy, and I think in the last 20 years there have been something like 14 million people cured from leprosy, which is great, isn't it? But try to put yourself in their situation just for a minute. Imagine either you or one of your family woke up one morning with a patch in your skin. And over the next day or weeks, it spread until it became confirmed that you did indeed have leprosy. Well, that would be an absolute disaster. If it was the father of the family, then there goes the breadwinner. And so mum is left to cope with the family. If it was mother, well, we all know um, that mothers are at the very core of the household. What about a brother or sister? Or what about a son or daughter? Jeff and I were just discussing this this afternoon at home, and uh, I got Jeff to, uh, he Googled um, the earliest known incidents of leprosy. And I think it was three weeks, is that correct? So imagine a baby, three weeks old, contracting leprosy. Mothers, what would you do? What would you do if your three-week-old baby contracted leprosy? Would you have it? Terrible decision, isn't it? I imagine most mothers wouldn't, but they would be cast out with their baby in order to look after them. True? I imagine so. So, it was fear, because to be diagnosed with leprosy was a life sentence. You became a social outcast. Girls would be no shopping. No more malls. Okay. No more sports. No attending public functions. Weddings. What about when one of your family members had a birthday and they were out there in the leper colony? Where would you leave the cake, for example? I mean, these are the sorts of things you would you would want to celebrate somehow, wouldn't you? You'd want to honour that birthday, and how would you do it? Leave the gift at a safe distance? All these practicalities we don't think about. Terrible, terrible. It affects the whole, the whole life. So we have ten men. Forced to wear torn clothing, so, that, so as to identify them easily, and so that people could get out of their way when they heard them coming, crying out, unclean, unclean. It's a cruel disease. 
And why I think it's probably more cruel than someone who's born blind or deaf or mute or paralyzed, it's because when you have someone who's born paralyzed, for example, they still have their family help, don't they? They don't tend to be abandoned. When you're born blind and deaf, generally the family rallies round and you have assistance. So you know you're loved. When you're born or if you can track leprosy, then there's no other way except to push you, push you out of society. Notice that God in his word, if you look here with me, and on his way to Jerusalem as he travelled along, he met ten men who had leprosy. I'll touch on this just briefly before. God in his word doesn't say he met ten lepers. God says Jesus met ten men with leprosy. So they're referred to, in God's eyes, they're not defined by their condition. Rather, they're seen as men, made in the likeness of God, with a terrible condition. I just want you to hold on to that thought, and we'll refer to that later on. Let's have a look at the ten men themselves. Firstly, they saw their condition. Well, you might say, how could they help but not see it? It was plainly visible, wasn't it? They could feel its effects. Were they going to deny it? Well, you could for a while. You could cover it up. You could wear long sleeves. You could tell yourself it didn't exist. It's not really there. You could tell yourself, oh, I'm feeling a bit better today. It must be going away. But untreated, there's only one direction for leprosy. And that is to worsen. It shows itself in more and more ways. And even if you manage to forget it, others will soon remind you. But they also saw their solution. Jesus was coming on the scene. And Jesus had been healing. In Luke chapter 4, verse 40, we read uh, that Jesus was in the house of Simon's mother-in-law. And after healing of Simon's mother-in-law, many people, or the people, brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses and lay. And laying his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God. He also gave power and authority to his twelve disciples. And in Luke chapter 9, we read that he gave them authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. A crippled woman was healed on the Sabbath, in Luke chapter 13. Yeah. Now, news of all these healings would travel pretty quickly. True, there was no internet, there was no Facebook or Twitter, but when you get miraculous events like this happening, and people's lives have been radically changed, and lives of relatives, news would travel fast, as people would travel fast. And so, they would have heard I imagine that he was coming because they knew who he was. And it says here in verse 12 that they met him. So these men obviously were on the outskirts of the village as Jesus was going in. And they intercepted him. They were very intentional in meeting up with Jesus because they knew that he was their only hope. I'm sure they tried other remedies. And I was reading up on remedies for leprosy, and there's everything from the bizarre to to the cruel, all sorts of wild and wacky types of snake oil happening over the years, many years, in the hope of curing leprosy. And so I'm sure if there was ever a cure offered, then they would have had it. But nothing worked. Here were ten men. Was leprosy. And so they stood at a distance and they cried out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And I want you to notice too that Jesus saw them. Now it doesn't say that Jesus looked at them, but it says that Jesus saw them. Now other people would also have seen them. 
But Jesus saw them in a way that no one else can see them. And I want just to uh, have a look briefly at what does Jesus see? What does God see? We have a God who sees. And the first recorded incident of God seeing something in the Bible is in the very first chapter of Genesis, verse 4. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness. And we read the account of creation. And God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. And as we move along a little to Genesis chapter 6, we note that God does not just see his good creation, but he also sees evil. The Lord God saw how great man's wickedness had been on the earth, how great it had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all of the time. What else does God see? Well, children, I wonder if you've ever seen a rainbow. You ever seen a rainbow? Seen a rainbow, Josh? Do you know that when you see a rainbow, God is also looking at the same rainbow, same time as you? Do you know that? Because God said in Genesis 9, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it. And whenever that, if the, and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So whenever you see a rainbow, I'll say, wow, look at all those colours. Or if you're like me and only see about three of them, <laughs> then remember, God sees at the same time as you. He also sees sparrows. We know that, don't we? Because God tells us that whenever a sparrow falls to the ground, not one will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. He sees them all. I preached at Lock Hill last week and I had to tell them there was one sparrow less than when I left home that morning. <coughs> Blew off the bumper bar, I'm afraid. But you know, God saw that. Even that sparrow. Not just the sparrows, all birds, all creation, things that we're patting ourselves on the backs for because we're so clever at getting down to the deepest ocean and seeing these things that we've never seen. Amazing creatures and some really ugly ones. You know, God sees all those things. And we pat ourselves on the back for getting out into landing a, 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 a machine onto a comet, or hoping to get near the comet. And yet God sees all that because he made it. He created it. He sees it all. He put it all in place. And God sees us. In Psalm 139, it says, Before we were born, God saw us. For well, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Can you get your head around that? We can see stuff that's formed. God sees stuff that's unformed. Not just using his imagination, but he sees it unformed. That's, wow. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He sees where, he, where we have come from. He sees where we are going. He sees where we are right now. He sees our past. He knows it all. He has brought us this far by his grace. He knows our present. He knows our situation. And he has it in his hand. He also sees our future, because he is the one who directs our future. But God doesn't see us as some detached observer. God feels. Back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, again, after God saw how great was man's wickedness on the earth, it says, The Lord God was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Filled with pain. God feels, doesn't he? How often when we're going through some dark times and we're tempted to think that God doesn't see, or if he does see, that he's somehow a little bit removed from our situation, 
doesn't really feel, doesn't really get it, what we're going through. But God feels. Feels deeply. And the Bible has much to say to encourage us as to how much he feels and what he feels about us and what he thinks about us. And here are some great verses which give us some great clues into the thoughts, desires and concerns that God has towards us. Psalm 139, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you have planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Have you ever thought how much God thinks of you? Does it ever occur to you that you're always on his thoughts? Always on his heart? Always. Have you ever had a love letter? Say, oh, I think of you all the time. Yeah. Perhaps you've written one or two as well. I think of you all the time. We've got a love letter here from God. I think of you all the time. You're always in my thoughts. And we would do well to remember that, wouldn't we? Easy to forget. Easy to forget. And also God wants to give us good things, and only good things. Which of you, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God is a good God who takes pleasure in blessing. The Bible is clear, story after story, passage after passage. God takes pleasure in being good to his people. And so we see the response of Jesus. Jesus saw but Jesus felt as well. And Jesus had ultimate knowledge as well. And as he looked at the men and they cried out, Jesus, Master, have pity on them. Jesus saw their situation. He saw what leprosy did. He saw their individual situation. He knew who they were, who their families were, what had happened to them, what happened in their past. He didn't say, oh, leprosy. Oh, that looks nasty. Better fix that. But he saw them. And he knew that they needed to be back in society, back with their families and restored. And so Jesus, having healed so many people, multitudes who were sick and dying, blind, lame, demon possessed, he healed them all as individuals. Can't find a, an account where Jesus did a mass healing. And then he looked over the crowd and just waved his hand and said, Everybody, bam, be healed. And they all were healed. Perhaps you can find one that I haven't spotted. But Jesus healed, from what I can see, everybody as individuals. And he works with us individually, doesn't he? He cares for us as individuals. Seeing and knowing each one. He demonstrated how much he knew when he had the conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4. He told her... Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Well, I imagine she took about ten quick steps backwards, quite blown away that Jesus knew so much about her. And so she said, ah, I see you're a prophet. But Jesus was more than a prophet. He's more than a prophet. He's the son of God. He's God himself. And are we ever tempted to think that we can hide anything from God? Think again. I don't think I can. In some silly way. Surely God hasn't seen that. But then... When I come to my senses and realise, well, yes, of course he did. 
Jesus, of course, did pity them. But not only did he pity them, he took pity on them because he had the compassion and the power to do both. He had power to act. Go show yourself to the priests. Well, I was thinking about this and thought, well, as an onlooker, that could be seen as quite a cruel joke. Here were these men with leprosy. You could see it in their hands and their faces and their feet, their bodies. And Jesus was saying to them, go, show yourself to the priests. You see, to be declared clean from leprosy, you have to go to the priests. And to go to the priests, you have to be clean. You couldn't go unless you were clean. And here they were, still in their leprosy, being told by Jesus to go and get a certificate of cleanliness. Sometimes people tell us that Christianity is a cruel joke. And yet we know, don't we, that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then you and I are the most to be pitied. And we'd be much better off out fishing or mowing the lawns tonight than sitting here looking into an antiquated book, wouldn't we? If Christ has not been raised. But has Christ been raised? He has, isn't he? And as they went, what happened? As they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. As they shuffled away together with their broken bodies, somewhere along the journey, they became cleansed. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? To be walking along at a safe distance, observing, and then all of a sudden they look down and say, hey, my hands are okay. Look at each other, your face is fine. Realising they now have been cleansed, new bodies. Jesus spoke and they were healed. Of course they were healed because Jesus, by his word, his almighty word with the power to, to heal. God spoke and the world was created. God spoke, his word went out. Bam. The world was created. Jesus spoke and they were healed. You know, we, like the ten lepers, have a need. I wonder if we see our need. In some ways, our need is much harder to spot than the lepers. We often don't recognise it. Now, we don't have leprosy, but we're born, the Bible tells us, with a much more serious condition. And sometimes it's harder to spot. Firstly, because everybody has it. Now, if you're the only one who's a sinner, then you'd be pretty much easy to spot, wouldn't you? Everybody would just point to you and say, oh, look, a sinner. Haven't seen one of them before. Take him out. But everybody has been born into sin. And the problem is, we have become used to our sin. It hasn't come upon us suddenly, but we're born with it. I have a little grandson who's only five months old coming up. And um, of course, in his grandmother's eyes, he's perfect and can do no wrong. But I know from previous experience of my own children and everybody else's children that somewhere, will come that point of rebellion. It might be a little point. It might be over. No, I don't want to go to bed. And then there'll be that little twinge of disappointment and think, oh no, it's just like the rest of us. <laughs> I remember with my own children. The first time we had that little rebellion with Rebecca. And like, oh no, yeah, of course. A sinner. We're all born into sin. And so, a little bit harder for us sometimes to acknowledge and to recognise that we have a need. But we have a great need. It is a worse need. It is more terminal than leprosy. It is one without hope. God's word to us gives us the full picture. Now we can choose to recognise that or we can deny it. And for many people, denial is the preferred option. In some ways it's easy to, to deny a sinfulness 
then to deny we have leprosy, because leprosy is obvious to everyone. We can cover our sin, we can attend church, we can do great things, we can even preach, we can be model citizens. But the Pharisees did all that too, and Jesus had some strong words to say to them. He called them hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, clean on the outside but inside, full of dead men's bones. They denied it. They denied they had sin, and so can we, to the end of our life. But we can't hide our sin from God. He sees it all. And in order to be true to himself as a holy God, totally consistent with his own holy nature, he must punish it. And like people with leprosy, all who carry sin with them to their death, sin that has not been confessed of and repented of, and washed away by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, they cannot be in the presence of a holy God or amongst holy people. And so God will banish anybody who has sinned, not just out of the village, but out of his presence eternally. And that's a terrible, terrible thing. And the only company that we can ever hope to have is people with a common disease called death. And that will be no company at all. The situation is urgent. If you haven't felt it before today, do you feel the urgency of your situation here this evening? Or will you continue to deny it? Who's right, you or God? You or the great physician? Jesus speaks today. And is, is his word any less powerful or any less effective than it was 2,000 years ago? Has the passing of time nullified any of his promises to us or changed his attitude towards us? No, he's the same yesterday, today and forever. He's the same in truth, in holiness, in power, in grace, in love and justice. He's not changed and he will not change. For he's God. What about us then? Has time improved us? Are we evolving into better people? As each generation of people come into the world, are they any less prone to sin? We have not changed. Our nature is still the same. Our need for salvation is still the same. Jesus sent the men with leprosy to the priests as they were the only ones who could give them their certificate cleanliness and restoration and freedom. They were the only ones who could declare them to be clean. In the same way, God sends us to the cross, to the cross of Calvary, where Jesus died as our sinless lamb. And we must confess our sin and leave it at the cross. And when we do so, then our great high priest Jesus becomes our guarantor. God points us also to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 4, a lovely verse, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have a wonderful high priest, and we can think that during the week, if we have done a few things we're not too happy about, we can stay away from our high priest, can't we? And yet God encourages us to come. Come often. Come always to Jesus, our great high priest. Don't be put off. Don't let sin keep us away. But come to the high priest and find that grace and help in time of need. Jesus sent them off as they were. And so they had to exercise a little faith. And Jesus calls us to come as we are. He says, don't try and tidy up your act first. Come as you are. 
Because if you try and patch up or cover over, then really you're only putting on your best suit over leprous skin. And as the leprous men had to go to the high priest, I imagine they'd have to strip off and show that there was no leprosy anywhere. When we come before God, we're stripped off of everything except righteousness. And only that is found in Jesus Christ. You can't come covering over leprosy. It's got to be cleaned up first. But Jesus says, come as you are. And as you come, you will be cleansed. It's amazing, isn't it? We talked this morning about a miracle. Andrew was talking about a miracle of the heart. And it is a miracle, isn't it? Here we have a wonderful physical and and also a, a wonderful permanent miracle in, in this healing of these leprous men. Here we have a healing, a wonderful miracle of the soul. Come as you are. And if you haven't come before, then come today. Time is urgent. The need is urgent. If you feel your love for him has grown cold, you are a Christian, then remember that his love for you has not changed. It will not change. Remember that his thoughts of you are uncountable. And you are always in his heart. And as that lone Samaritan came back praising God in a loud voice, throwing himself at Jesus' feet, thanking him, then let that be our practice. For the days and years ahead, let's be people of praise and thankfulness for what God has done and is doing and will do for us. Praise is so important. Just as we wind up, gratitude, a life of gratitude, is the appropriate and the only right response. It's a real barometer, I believe, of where we're at with God, of our understanding of what God has done for us. It's an indication of what we believe and know to be true. And to be able to praise God in all circumstances is a wonderful thing. Perhaps we're not where we want to be in our walk with God. Praise is a great way to bring us back, reflecting on God's goodness. The promises in His Word and thanking him constantly for that. And if we're not walking with him, then come. Because he has said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. If you're not a Christian, go to the cross. And leave your burden there. You are a Christian, and let us come with praise and thanksgiving. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we can find help in our times of need. Let's pray. Mighty God, we thank you for this reminder from your word. And just how you feel about us, what you think about us, how you've acted for us. And Lord, we just thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and how he acted and resolutely setting his face towards Jerusalem, heading for the cross, knowing what was ahead, and yet having us in our thoughts as he went. Help us, Lord, to remember that. And knowing that and remembering that, to have uh, that wonderful sense of gratitude. Help us to praise you as we all... Lord, we can pray that um, this coming week you will um, watch over us and uh, let these thoughts dwell in our hearts. We all glory and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.